be the price of some of the best of one, and, and of course when the high priest spoke, uh, he had to answer him according to the law, and so Jesus finally said, okay. Uh, he said, I am, verse 62. A lot of people say Jesus never really came out and called himself uh, the son of the, the living God, the Christ, the Messiah. But here he said, I am, verse 62. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Uh, you think the high priest uh, would be excited at the coming of Jesus in the clouds? Uh, you think this high priest, he was a judge of Jesus, you think uh, when Christ comes in the clouds, he's going to really be happy about that? Uh, of course not. So the coming of Jesus is a blessing to some, but great consternation to others. And there's going to be Annas and Cleophas and uh, Herod and Pontius Pilate and others there. And even the soldier who pierced Jesus is in, in verse 7. Uh, all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So while it's a blessed coming for some people, uh, it is anguish and wrath to other people. And the man who pierced him, uh, God put it in his heart to throw that spear in his side. He'd always made up his mind that he was going to make sure Jesus was dead. But the manner of killing him uh, was given to him by God because if he'd have broken his bones, the Bible would not have been the word of God. Because the Bible says it, uh, a bone shall not be broken. Uh, when, they, uh, uh, when they prepared to pass over the lamb, uh, that, that lamb was to be roasted whole and Jesus was to be offered uh, whole and entire in his body. Had they broken his bones, they would have violated the passage. And if I were a critic, if I were a skeptic, I'd say there's a discrepancy in the Bible. They broke his bone. Uh, the Passover lamb could not have a bone broken. So uh, if he had broken his bones, it would have uh, invalidated the word of God. So he, uh, uh, God just put it in his heart. He's going to kill him, but he's going to kill him by thrusting the spear into his side. And water and blood gushed out. And, and you know, sometimes when we, uh, sometimes when we think about, uh, they gnashed on him with their teeth, they pierced his side, they, uh, his whole body was just broken down from head to toe. Uh, the body of Jesus was uh, totally rent, broken. And uh, uh, do I need to have a handheld mic, or can you hear me back? No, we can, sorry. We, we can hear you. Uh, uh, but for that, do I need a hand towel? Okay. You're good. You, you're okay. Uh, okay, the body of Jesus, it says, was broken. Uh, not his bones, but his body. Uh, and uh, so they gnashed on him. Not only did they break his body, but they actually gnashed on him with their teeth. And uh, the body of Jesus was greatly disfigured. And uh, have, have you, would you do a thing like that? Would you gnash on Jesus' body with your teeth? Well, every Sunday you do. Every Sunday when you take the Lord's Supper, the only difference between you when you partake of the Lord's Supper is you are lovingly, reverently, and sincerely partaking of his body. Whereas when they gnashed on his body, they were in a very ugly mood. They wanted blood. They wanted to kill him. And to make sure that his body died, they were going to aid it by gnashing on him with their teeth. Uh, so he not only had uh, scalp wounds, nail wounds, spear wounds, uh, they beat on him with their fists, he had hemorrhaging wounds, penetrating wounds as they uh, thrust the spear on his side, but he even had bite wounds on his body. And uh, those little wounds will be seen, the Bible says in heaven somehow, uh, the body of Christ will be seen with those wounds. It's an unforgettable impression that that's what you and I did. We inflicted these wounds on him. And I tell you, when you take the Lord's Supper Sunday, I want you to think about that. When you eat the body and drink from the blood of Jesus, and uh, God sees that body and blood of his Son, he never forgets that. It's a very important thing. And so the coming of Jesus is it, it's great comfort to some, but the coming of Jesus to others, uh, it would be like uh, taking the corpse out of the grave. Uh, the skeleton comes out of the closet. There's some things in life we just don't want to face. And for a Christ-rejecting person, it will be great mourning of hopelessness. The whole world will mourn because of him. And there's two parallels here. In verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, you know, Jesus doesn't keep time. He doesn't need a watch. He created time. And uh, he says this several times. Uh, 
Uh, he says it in the 21st chapter of Revelation, verse 6 uh, through 8. I am the, the Alpha and Omega, the first to last. He says it also in chapter 22, verse 13. It's a self-designation. And uh, the fact that Jesus is above time puts him in the category of the Godhead. Because Christ is eternal. The Spirit is eternal. God is eternal. God doesn't have to call himself the Alpha of the Omega. The Spirit doesn't have to call himself the Alpha of the Omega. But Christ does because Christ appeared in a human body. And we would have been a little suspicious of him uh, because he was in a human body. We had to realize as we look past his body that he never was subject to time. Uh, he created the world and yet he gave up all of his glory. Uh, he was here before time began, but he gave up all of his glory. Uh, he'll be here after time expired, when times will be no more. And uh, one of the angels is so impressed with his announcement, you know. Uh, he's on the stage and he has a part to play. And he's so excited about coming out of the temple and putting one foot on the sea and uh, putting the other foot uh, on the land and raising his uh, hand to heaven. And he says, time shall be no more. Now that's going to be a dramatic episode in the, in the world, the universe, that all the people who have been subject to time are going to be released from it into eternity. And uh, Christ, of course, all along was above time and beyond time. Uh, so we see the equality of the Godhead in this statement of Christ, uh, that only he, no angel, can say he's above time uh, because the angels were created in time. No demon can say he's above time because demons were created in time. No man or woman can say they're above time because we were created in time and we are subject to time. Once Christ says he is a, 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 above time, then that is equality with the Godhead. Another equality with the Godhead is, uh, is uh, in verse 4, uh, he says, uh, uh, Grace be to you, peace from him who is and who was and who is to be, uh, is to come, that is, that's God the Father, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, that's God the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, verse 5, that's God the Son. Uh, there's equality in that verse, uh, and that verse corresponds to verse 8, uh, where he again says, uh, I am the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord God. <laughs> and just as he called God the Father in verse 5, one who was uh, above time, uh, who is who was and who is to come, he also calls himself the Lord God. He calls himself in a designated way uh, the Eternal One, and then he calls himself the Almighty. So nothing can be clearer that we have the right Christ when we worship him. He is indeed entitled to Godhead status by those statements that he made. In verse 9, I, John, your brother and fellow, uh, protector in the tribulation, and the kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, uh, I mean, John is preaching one minute, uh, and the next minute he's whisked away by the authorities. He's removed from his pulpit or wherever he's uh, serving God, and he's taken away and banished to this island, island of Patmos. And uh, this is a, a geographical chart that you can get. You can pick it up at, during our break. And you can see Patmos right off the, uh, 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 in the Aegean Sea. Uh, Patmos is about uh, perhaps 60 by 40, uh, uh, about a three miles by uh, two miles. Uh, it's a very small uh, island. Uh, it was a place where it was like a, an Alcatraz. Uh, it was like a uh, devil's island. It was a place where the worst criminals were uh, incarcerated. And uh, there he went to that little island, and uh, uh, he's there uh, along the seashore. Uh, they didn't kill him, and I'm, I'm probably convinced that they didn't kill him because John was a very popular apostle. Uh, he was a great man of justice and truth. He was also a great man of love. Uh, he knew how to blend and balance love and justice. Uh, some people can't do that. Some people love, love, love until it's nothing but wimpy, mushy love. And then other people were so just and, uh, and so harsh that, 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 that you can't get close to them, you know? Uh, they're like a porcupine, you know? <laughs> a lot of fine points, but you can't get close to them, you know? And uh, that's the way that they are. And uh, 
Uh, but, but John had a temperance uh, uh, of both. And if you read First John, uh, the great loving apostle, man, he knew how to say it like it is. And yet, uh, people feared him because of his great love. And uh, uh, so uh, I'm convinced the authorities were afraid to kill John because it would cause a great uproar among the Christians uh, in Asia. And so by banishing him, they thought they could silence him. Uh, same thing happened in China, Charles Lamb. He's over there now. And uh, they're doing all they can to, to try to silence the, the house churches in communist China. Charles Lamb is one of their great leaders. If they killed him, uh, they would probably stir up a, a lot of Chinese Christians. And so they just tried to, uh, uh, they tried to limit his influence in China. Another great man was Watchman Nee, one of my favorite authors. Watchman Nee was a Chinese uh, preacher. Uh, he was incarcerated in a Chinese concentration camp. Uh, he wrote uh, uh, approximately 50 books. Uh, if you ever see any of his books in print, you might want to buy them. He's very close to what we believe uh, about the New Testament. Uh, he finally died in, in a communist concentration camp. But he too had such influence in China that they were afraid to kill him. And so putting a man away, incarcerating him, uh, you don't stir up his, uh, the people who love him so much. And uh, they thought they could really dispose of John, your, your brother, your fellow partaker of the tri tribulation. Now, in verse 9, uh, this is not a tribulation. Uh, I don't know how anybody can read a tribulation into that. That happened 2,000 years ago. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. Uh, in fact, the Bible says it's through much tribulation uh, that we enter into the kingdom of God. And uh, uh, Timothy talks about how that, uh, uh, if you're a Christian, you're going to have tribulation. Uh, and distress. Uh, uh, what John is saying here is, uh, I'm a fellow sufferer with you. I'm an apostle, yes. Yeah. He's also a, a gospel preacher. Uh, he's also a, an elder in the church, the Bible says, in uh, Peter. Uh, uh, no, that was, Peter was an elder in the church. He was an apostle. But, but John, uh, we don't know what his status was, but he just loved to be called a, a, a brother and a fellow partaker of tribulation uh, and, and, and the kingdom and perseverance which were in Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be great if every one of us would look at each other tonight and just simply say, we're all fellow members of tribulation. Who are we? We're fellow members of tribulation. We're going through hell on earth. You want to know the truth. It'd be great if we would identify ourselves as that. You know, uh, instead of Chuck Downey, the preacher, uh, and uh, uh, you, uh, a deacon, uh, or whatever you might be, that doesn't count. That's just your service to God. Our, our classification is we're slaves, we're prisoners, and we're fellow sufferers. Amen. Now, are you suffering for Christ? You can't say that if you're not having tribulation. You know, a lot of people can't stand tribulation. But all you've got to do is do what John did. You've got to believe the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, anytime you see testimony of Jesus, it comes from the Greek word martyr. It's sometimes called witness. It always means an advocate of New Covenant Christianity, New Testament Christianity. All you have to do to get in trouble is embrace New Testament Christianity exclusively. <laughs> That's all you got to do. Just believe it. Just believe it and, and, and tell people you believe it. To the exclusion of creeds, catechism, church councils, denominational leadership, whatever it might be, world religions. Uh, all you got to do tonight is just go out there and tell somebody, I'm a pure New Testament Christian, nothing more, nothing less, and you, I guarantee you, before this night's over, we'll be in an argument for a shout match. No bones picked. Amen. Amen. Exactly. That's all you got to do. And what John got in, all John had to do was quit preaching New Testament Christianity, and he would have still been... On, on the island of Asia Minor, uh, eating chicken and dumplings and just having a wonderful time. Uh, that is all through the book of Revelation. It starts there. And what's it say over here in Revelation chapter 20? Now, I want to make this perfectly clear. What got him into trouble? In Revelation 20, he said, I saw the thrones in verse 4. They had set upon them, and judgment was given to them. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of what? Because of what? Nothing more, nothing less. They didn't have a creed. They didn't have a religious book. They didn't have a discipline. They didn't have anything to believe. 
If I told you I believe in the, uh, the Book of Mormon, I, I'm not going to get my head cut off. Or people might feel sorry for me. People might say, well, he's a little different. I'm not going to get my head cut off for that. If I say I believe in the Westminster Confession of Faith, I'll say, well, that's a respectable breed in Christendom. If I tell them I believe in the, uh, the Philadelphia Hanker, uh, New Hampshire Confession of Faith, that's a fine thing to believe, you know. And, and you know, no judgment at all inferred here. I'm just saying. If people want to believe that, fine. I'm not going to sit here and judge them. But I'm just saying this. They will judge you every time you say all I want to accept is the New Testament for my rule of faith and practice and doctrine, the plan of salvation, and the way the church is governed. That's all I'm going to accept is the New Testament. Amen. You will get in trouble. And if you're not in trouble, it's because you are mealy mouth keeping your mouth shut about that important teaching because that means a lot to God, that means a lot to Jesus Christ, that testimony that we read in that New Testament. Amen. But one nice thing about it, when you got that, you know you're right. And there's nothing like knowing you're right once in a while. Because mm -hmm. I've been wrong all of my life. Maybe that's why I'm such a prolific advocate of New Testament Christianity because I've never been right in my life until I found that. <laughs> that's the only thing I can be right on. I'm not good on computers. I'm not good at anything. I can't even drive right. <laughs> you ought to see me drive. I'll tell you, my angels are always up in the air harping about the way I drive. <laughs> now, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in your tribulations and kingdom. Now, notice he didn't say in verse 9 the kingdom is going to come someday. What kingdom was he in? Talk about that, you get in trouble, too. <laughs> You mean God's got a kingdom? Oh, yeah, he does. Where's it at? <laughs> I can't see it. Whoever said you had to see the kingdom? I'm glad you can't see it, aren't you? Because if you had, if you could see it, you could only see it in one place. We'd have to go find it, wouldn't we? I'm glad you can't see it, because if you can't see it, where's it at? Where? Heaven. Everywhere. There you go. All right, now, in Colossians 1, what's he say here? Uh, that God sanctified you, you heard the gospel, and uh, after the, uh, uh, the, the gospel came to you, uh, he informed you in the word of God, uh, and we ought to give thanks to the Father, verse 12, who qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, brothers and sisters, the same kingdom that the Apostle John was in 2,000 years ago when he's on the Isle of Patmos is the kingdom that you got into when you were born again in the water and spirit in this 20 or 21st century. Now that's pretty exciting that you can be a member of the same kingdom that John was in. But remember, it's a kingdom of tribulation. It's not, a, it, it, right now, it is not a triumphant kingdom. It is a militant kingdom. Someday, it will be the kingdom in trial. Same kingdom. It's not two different kingdoms. It's just that the kingdom militant will someday be the kingdom triumphant. Right? Uh, the kingdom militant means you're at war. <laughs> you remember when they wanted to take the uh, uh, armored Christian soldiers out of the Bible? This is, this is Adam. Our, he came to visit us at Maryland Avenue, and I just ran into him at the cafeteria. The cafeteria is open till midnight. So you can get, oh. we can get smoothies and anything well, okay, you want. Okay, well, we'll just, we'll, that's great. They're keeping it open tonight. We can, uh, we can do a midnight moon blast. Adam, uh, Adam was a I'll hang around as long as you want. Adam Hall is his name, and he has a great love for the Bible and the Word of God. And he's, he's an old-fashioned, John Wesley, conservative, Bible-believing Methodist. Amen? Amen. Right. So, so, so we're about the same height, actually, from what I understand. Well, I, invited him, I invited him over here. If uh, He's got a business meeting right now, but maybe he'll be with us sometime. Yeah, I'm glad I'm aware, but I wouldn't have known otherwise. But there's another group that meets around the same time also. Okay, brother, you keep on networking. Keep on networking. <laughs> uh, that's a lot of sinners. It's a, lot of you know, a lot of people who are potential converts out there. There's a lot of people who love the Lord out there. Some who don't love the Lord. Reminds me of uh, when... Uh, uh, the guy down here, uh, it's on uh, Route uh, 81, as you go down here, it's called uh, uh, 
uh, I believe Waynesboro, what's the name of it? Stewart's Draft. Stewart's Draft. I don't know if that's named after Jeb Stewart or not. Uh, maybe you know more about the history of this valley than I do, but I know that Jeb Stewart did a lot of recruiting here. And Jeb Stewart was a, uh, he was a tremendous uh, uh, fighter. He wasn't afraid of anything. And, uh, and uh, one day he disappeared and all the Confederates got together and said, poor old Jeb, he must have got killed. He had been gone for a couple of days. <laughs> and, uh, so about uh, a few days later, they were getting ready to have, uh, have their meal, you know, and uh, here comes Jeb walking down and out of the wards with about seven Yankees tied up to him. Uh, and uh, he had them stripped almost naked, uh, so they wouldn't give him any trouble, had their shoes off, had their bare feet, <laughs> and they, they were completely uh, helpless. And he brought them in there, and all the Confederates jumped up and started rallying and said, Jeb, Jeb, where'd you get all those Yankees at? He said, man, he said, they're like jackrabbits. You're out there in the woods, all you got to do is grab and get them. <laughs> and that's the way it is with, with, with winning people to Christ. They, you know, how am I going to win souls? Man, they're sitting right next to you. Uh, who's your neighbor? The guy lives next to you, right? And, and Jesus talked about your neighbor. I, I'm amazed that, that, that uh, we don't go out and get more Yankees or a lot of them out there in the woods. <laughs> so uh, he says that uh, uh, it was because of the Word of God. Now, he said, I was in spirit on the Lord's Day, verse 10. And, uh, I, I thought the best material I could find on that was none other than our brother uh, Roger Clark. Uh, he did an excellent job on uh, the Lord's Day. Uh, and uh, why the Lord's Day, uh, which is uh, the first day of the week, uh, it is uh, in the Bible. Uh, <laughs> where should you be <laughs> on the Lord's Day? <laughs> where should you be? Huh? <laughs> you to, well, first of all, you ought to be in spirit on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is one day a week. Uh, at least be in spirit on the Lord's Day. I like to get up in the morning in the spirit, go all day in the spirit, and walk in the spirit, and, uh, eat the Spirit and go to bed at night in the Spirit and get up and recycle that. The Bible said you need the Spirit all the time. But man, you should always be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And yet sometimes we drag into church and we sit down, you know, and we've got cobwebs in our nostrils and we got mildew under our armpits, you know, we've been sitting there so long. And we get excited about everything under the sun and we trudge into church, and we're in anything but the Spirit of God. And the way that we sing, the way that we pray, there's no enthusiasm in it. And uh, I'll tell you what, if John can be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day by himself on the island of Patmos, why can't you and I be in the Spirit when we're with a whole lot of people in uh, Rockingham County on the Lord's Day? You hear that? He was in Spirit, buddy. And uh, every Lord's Day we ought to be in spirit, coming together on the first day of the week. Now, uh, you can read Roger Hart's material on that, and there's no doubt now, uh, the futurists who believe that all this book of Revelation uh, is for the future, they say that's the day of the Lord. Uh, John was in spirit on the day of the Lord. Well, that doesn't make a bit of sense. Uh, they call it the Judgment Day. Uh, that, that's not the day that John's talking about. And, uh, of course, I, I read a lot of commentaries. And uh, I have a commentary here uh, by Hendrickson, William Hendrickson, who wrote more than Conquerors. He's a very good author. And uh, he says that the Lord's Day is no, doubtless, doubtless, the first day of the week. Uh, he says that uh, 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 Dean Alford, who was another great uh, scholar, he said, it is astounding that any would persuade himself to give a futurist time of the day of the Lord to the Lord's Day. Uh, he says, uh, this is the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. This is the, 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 the day of, uh, of the Lord, the, the day of Yahweh. Uh, and Alfred said, it's, uh, it's astounding that anybody can read uh, that this is the day of the Lord in that text to try to give it a future connotation. And uh, then uh, uh, Alfred Sweet, another great uh, uh, author on the Revelation, he said, uh, the first day of the week is altogether uh, different then the interpretation of the day of the Lord. He said the day of the Lord is a silly interpretation. That this is not the day of the Lord. This is the Lord's day. Uh, uh, the Lord's day is a consecutive thing. It, it shows continuity. The Lord's day. The Lord's day. But when you talk about the day of the Lord, that's one day. One day, and that's the end of the world. And this couldn't be that day. Because if it was, the book of Revelation would never have been written. <laughs> So this is the Lord's Day. I, 
Uh, I could go on on that, but I haven't got time, so I, I got uh, Brother Hart's material there. You can read it when you go home tonight. It's good stuff. In fact, I have so much material that's accumulated that I taught this uh, class back in uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, or 2001, and here's one of my students' books. That's how much stuff I just passed out then, and I have more now. So this is the kind of notebook you're going to need by, by the time you finish this 10-week course. Uh, and every, every time I come, I have handouts. I have handouts from last week. I have handouts for this week. Uh, you probably have last week's handouts already. But uh, uh, he said, I was in spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Now, I heard a loud voice. Notice that? But now, <laughs> it gives a description of Jesus in verse 11, 12, and then he said, I turned to see the what? Now, anybody who literalizes the word of God is going to have a problem with that. If you literalize the book of Revelation, you're going to have a big problem with that. I turned to see what? The voice. The voice. Who ever turned to see a voice? This is a voice. Remember back in the day uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve were in the garden? Uh, and it said they heard a voice walking. We talked about that. Yeah, a voice walking. Now, how can a voice walk? Here he's seen a voice. Now he hears a voice walking. Uh, let, me, let me show you something here that I think is important. As I mentioned before, God spoke the word, the Logos. And uh, the word became flesh. Now, how did God make flesh out of his word? Emmanuel, God with us. The brain, the brain, the brain. Okay. Through the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. Okay. Now, I'll give you another syllogism here to maybe train your mind a little bit. We have Adam and we have Eve. And out of a rib, God made bone of Adam's bone and flesh of Adam's flesh, okay, out of a rib. Now, God can make a woman out of a rib, can he make his son out of the word? You never hear anybody say, how can that be? How can you make a woman out of a rib? Nobody argues about that. Because that is not a doctrinal test as to whether you're saved or not. I mean... Surely you believe the Word of God. But it's not as important if God making flesh out of His Word, Jesus. Now, if you read the book of Genesis chapter 5, this is important that we see some of these great miracles in the Bible of uh, what we call uh, the, the identification with God and man and the unity of God and man and how God can communicate with man. It says in uh, chapter 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when he created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Man in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. He blessed them and he named them what? Man. But, that's horrible to call it man. Because if you look at the footnote of your Bible, that's not what the word says at all. Adam. Adam. So, when you looked at Eve, what did you call her? Adam. 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 And when you looked at Adam, what did you call him? Adam. 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 That's where the idea of a woman taking a man's name came from until Hillary Rodham Clinton came along. You know? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you know, you can't overturn it. You cannot overturn that without suffering consequences because that's a built-in law. The woman takes the man's name, okay? But that's a very important law. It's more, more to it than we think there is. Because they were called Adam. At first, or later on, she was called Eve. She was, she was given a name Eve. The name Eve identified her as a separate entity, but at first they were equal, right? When did they become unequal? When she was the first in the trans. When she sinned, she lost her equality with her husband. 
Now, a woman can get back equality with her husband in Christ, because in Christ now, that's been reversed. We're all one. There's no male or female. My wife and I are one in Christ. In the government of our home, the man's supposed to be the head. Just, and that's the way it goes back to Adam. So Eve got the name, not because she was an eavesdropper, but because that she was in on the, the sin, the first sin, okay? And then she had to have her own identity. Now, when Christ married the church, God took from Christ's side a bride, right? Right? When Christ shed his blood, he purchased a bride, right? And Christ and his church are one. God and the Son are one. Notice the unity here. And what name do we wear? His companion. Catholic. Yeah. Hindu. You know, it's amazing. And I'm saying this. I'm just, I'm just being funny. I'm just being funny, right? What name did she wear when she married her husband? It was Adam. And what name do we wear when we come to Christ? You see, it's important. That name, Christ, is very important. We're going to see his name all through Revelation. He said, are you holding fast to my name? Are you keeping my name? Is my name priority? What would happen if everybody in the world, the guy we just met there, a dedicated man, he loves the Lord, I know he does. But what would happen if he called himself a Christian? And what would happen if every denomination in the world just called himself a Christian? And everybody said, we're going to drop all these labels that we have, and we're just going to call ourselves Christians, like Eve called herself Adam. And we all get back to the bride of Christ, what would happen? I'll tell you what, we have one church in the world, and we put heathenism and atheism out of business. We would put heathenism and atheism out of business. Because the reason there are so many heathens and atheists and world religions is because we Christians are not united by the name of Jesus Christ. You have to have a label and a tag. And we've got to drop those labels and tags and start giving Christ all honor and heaven and earth. Amen. All right, now. This vision of Jesus. He's going to write a book and send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, Myrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, uh, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, that that is uh, that that's that is not literally just only seven churches. As you can see from this map I have here, there's a lot of other cities. But why did he just pick seven churches? Why didn't he talk about Syria, Antioch? Symbolic name for perfection. Right. Seven is the number of perfection, completion, and you're going to see in every age some of the problems some of the protests, some of the condemnations, some of the prosecutions, some of the judgments, some of the blessings that are in these seven comprehensive churches. In other words, it's a picture of all churches in all ages that need to be judged by Jesus Christ. And that's why that these seven churches represent my congregation as well. I have to look at myself. This is serious, serious. Remember, his eyes are like fire. And he's able to x-ray a paralyzed church, look right into that church, and tell you what's wrong with it. He's able to take the body of, of the church, just like an MRI, just like a, just like a, 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 a body that is in the x-ray or uh, under the, the, the radar, and they can look inside there and not only just see the cancer, see the heart problems, see the digestive problems, but he can see the very throb and the pulsation of the heart, the brain, and the mind, everything we're thinking. You know, one of the things that scares me to death is over here in John. It's John, I believe, chapter 5, I believe. And he concludes his great message on the... Uh, on the, uh, the man and the quail, I mean the, uh, the man of the bread and so forth. And uh, it says that Jesus knew what was in man. He didn't have to 
He didn't have to ask questions. He didn't accept flattery. Uh, he didn't accept uh, people's uh, uh, buttering him up uh, because he knew what was in man. And uh, uh, I, I, it's in, I know it's in John. And it's a beautiful passage. Oh, here it is. Let's see. Uh, it might be, here it is, chapter 2. Uh, in verse 23, he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast. Many believed in his name, beholding his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them for renew all men. Now, what's that mean? He wasn't, he's not going to commit himself, is he? Because if you know what's in a man and you commit yourself and you trust that man and and you lay yourself on the line for that man, he may, be, he may betray you, right? Have you ever put your life on the line and in the hands of someone else and it turned right around and stabbed you in the back or betrayed you? Okay? So if you, if you knew what was in man, then you wouldn't do that, would you? So Jesus could look into their hearts and he said, I'm not committing myself to this guy because I know what he's thinking. I know what's in his heart. Uh, Sister, we're in John uh, uh, 2, 24, talking about Jesus and how he didn't commit himself because uh, he knew it was in people's hearts and he was afraid they'd betray him as he committed himself to them. But in verse 25, uh, and it says, because he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning him. In other words, uh, he didn't need somebody coming up and saying, I believe you're the Son of God. Why? Because he already knew what they believed. You see, we can't fool Jesus. And what Jesus is doing here is turning the searchlight of his omniscient and his omnipresent eye and looking at us through those eyes of fire, looking into the churches. Now, uh, the, uh, I, I used to be a Schofield. I, uh, when I was in college, I, I followed uh, Charles Schofield. I read his Schofield Bible, and uh, I thought that was the way it should be. I read all the footnotes and everything. And uh, uh, Schofield said these seven churches uh, are really not a, a, a picture of all churches, but he said the first church uh, is from the year 1 to the year 300 A.D. And then he says that the, the, the second church is from the year uh, uh, actually 250, uh, 1 to 250. The second church, he says, is from the year 250 to 311. Now then he said the next church stands for uh, 311 to, to the year 800. <laughs> and then he said the next church stands for from 800 to 1200. And then he says the next church stands for the history uh, of the world from 1200 to 1500. And then he says the next church, which is the last one, uh, Stands for the 1600. I, I don't know how he got that, but uh, he said that this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The Laodicean Church stands for uh, rationalism from 1600 on. Now we're living in the year 2008. It's 400 years. Schofield's dead and gone now. I would beg your indulgence in answering the question, how did Schofield arrive at those dates? How did Schofield arrive at the idea that the church at Ephesus was a historical scheme for 250 years, and the church of Smyrna, 250 to 311, the church of Pergamos, 311 to 800? Where did those dates come from? Or did he just dream them up in his mind? Arbitrary, you see. That's why Revelation is a book that loans itself to the lunatic friend. <laughs> You're right, man. <laughs> it's an awful long book. Yeah. And to think this guy wrote a Bible. Actually, he wrote a commentary and used the Bible as a footnote. That's rough. Yeah. He used the Bible as a footnote. And he read all of these things into it and gave those arbitrary dates, had no authority, had absolutely no record, had absolutely no predecessor, 
had absolutely no record from history to come up and arrive at those dates. He just simply put them in there, put them in the Bible, so when people read the Bible, they had to think like this. Now, what would be the next day? Suppose we, suppose, I mean, if Jesus carries, suppose we go to the year 3000. <laughs> if we go to the year 3000, well, we've got a big boy here, don't we? We're going to have to say, hey, Schofield, can you remember those dates so we can get a letter within him, you know? <laughs> That's serious business. Because the Bible says, he who adds to this book, the place will be added to his life. He who subtracts from this book, his name will be subtracted from the hand of the Bible. So uh, that's the way that we see some people interpreting the scriptures. And if that's the way you look at scripture, you're going to have a hard time with me. <laughs> because the book of Revelation is a whole lot more uh, sacred to me than to give these arbitrary dates. Uh, just out of my top of my head. Uh, so he says in verse 11, uh, he, he, he said, write a book. Uh, that what you see. Write in a book. That what you see. What? Now, when is this book written? When is this book written? This book of Revelation. When is it written? 75 AD. All right. Okay. Now, here's the point I'm making. Almost every scholar that you read says that this book was written about 96 AD. The Catholic Church says that it was not really available to the year 350 AD. You, you didn't get that from Brother Larry. <laughs> yeah. Brother Larry, he talked about that. All right, now, now, in the back of this, the date of Revelation from last week's note, Notes. The date of Revelation is uh, that Clement of Alexandria says that all Revelation ceased under Nero, uh, Claudius, uh, Nero, uh, his, uh, his reign. Uh, the moratorium canon that Dr. Crane mentioned so many times when he was here says that it was completed before uh, seven of Paul's letters. Paul died in the year AD 68. Tertullian uh, puts John's banishment in conjunction with Peter and Paul's martyrdom, 67, 68, when Peter was crucified uh, upside down. They went after Peter and Paul, and th then they went after John. So there, this is a terrible persecution going on. Uh, Epiphanius uh, writes that Revelation was written under Claudius Caesar. Uh, Nero's full name was Nero Claudius Caesar. Uh, and uh, that was in uh, 68 AD. Uh, the Syrian version even has written in Patmos where John was sent by Nero Caesar. So the Syrian version of the Bible even gives the time. And I could go on. I, I, I got 12 reasons why that it was written before 70 AD. So why do people say it was written in 96 AD? You know why they say it was written in 96 AD? because somebody told them it was written in 96 A.D. And you know why that somebody told them that it was written in 96 A.D.? Because somebody told them it was written in 96 A.D. And somebody told them it was written in 96 A.D., okay? I know when I went to college, they told me it was written in 96 A.D., and they didn't give me one proof that it was written in 96 A.D. Not one proof. I've given you 12 proofs that it was written before 70 A.D. Now, isn't that amazing? For one thing, the temple was still standing when it was written. Because John saw the temple. Now, it's true he saw in vision, but if the temple was destroyed, John would have said something about it. But I could go on and on. But here's the thing that, God, that Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, brother, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. Do you think that John said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do that in about... 25 years. Or maybe I'll do it in the year 350 A.D. If all you knew was that verse of Scripture, you would know that Bible was circulated, that book was circulated very quickly. Now, I'll tell you how quickly they could circulate things back in those days. It says that in the days of Julius Caesar, there went out a decree that all the world should be taxed. So you think Julius Caesar sat around stroking his beard and scratching his bald head and saying, 
man, I wonder when they're going to get this decree out because we just can't get things out very quick around here. Uh, might take five, six, seven, eight years, maybe 350 A.D. before we can get this taxation out. Huh? You think that Claudius Caesar was saying that? You think that Claudius Caesar had the ways and the means to circulate a taxation letter to the whole world in his day? Well, of course he did. Now, those people weren't stupid. You know, we look back in the Roman Empire and think the Pax uh, Romana Empire uh, was kind of backward because they didn't have computers, you know. But I'll tell you what. Those people had navigation, and they had circulation, and they had inner commerce. In fact, you could get on a ship and go to Alexandria, and from Alexandria to Rome, you could do it in a week's time, if, if the weather was fair. So his book was written and circulated to the churches very quickly, so that all those churches could have gotten all that we have today in a matter of weeks. Maybe even less than that because the Holy Spirit was behind it. We're going to ask God to bless us. We're going to take a break. We're going to get some coffee and fellowship, and then we're going to come right back again. Just bow our heads. Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you, God, for the time we can have together here to uh, study your word, especially this blessed book of Revelation, and uh, to see, dear God, the way that Christ is in charge of the churches, working through the churches, and loving us, rebuking us, judging us, blessing us, and Lord, we just thank you, God, that this book, that is such a book that when we read it, God, we know Christ is already coming. Uh, he's as good as come already. He's, uh, he, he, his promises are true. He's faithful. And we pray we'll have a good fellowship together here as we uh, take this uh, little break here. And we thank you for this classroom that we can continue to teach your holy word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. get a picture of Jesus here and uh, we're going to see uh, that uh, the voice okay the word the voice wouldn't it be great if we just could see the voice and follow the voice the voice walking the voice walking uh, where's that voice walking at where's that voice walking at He's walking through these aisles right now. That voice is walking through the churches. That voice is everywhere. And I'll tell you what, we better pay attention to the voice. We better heed the voice. And those who neglected to hear in the Old Testament, they died. And God spoke from Mount Sinai. He said he spoke on the earth through the apostles. He said, one more time I'm speaking, but the next time I speak, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I'd much rather hear him speak now than to hear him speak when he shakes the heavens and the earth. We will hear his voice. We're all members of the body of Christ. We're in the church of Christ, and he's walking. Now, his definition here is that we don't know him according to the flesh anymore. Paul said, we're not going to tell you what Jesus looked like, the color of his skin, how tall he was, 
what color his hair was. He said, we don't know Jesus in the flesh anymore. Forget Jesus in the flesh. Man, artists and composers and people, they, they, they want to picture Jesus in the flesh all the time. And they always put him with long hair on. That's one thing I always do, long-haired Jesus. And yet Paul saw him and said, it's a shame for a man to have long hair, and I'm not... Uh, I'm not trying to take a backhand and slap against people, who, men who let, let their hair uh, go long. I'm not, I'm not doing that. And, and the Lord knows I got a, a number of them that come to hear me preach every Sunday, but Jesus didn't have long hair. Paul saw him. And, 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 he, and when he said it's a shame for a man to have long hair, he probably would have said except for Jesus. He got long hair and got away with it. You see, all these artist conceptions, you know. <laughs> All these artists' conceptions are of Jesus in the flesh. Uh, one woman said to me last week, she said, why don't we have a big picture of Jesus in the church so we can pray to him? Oh, man, after all the years I've been preaching. I mean, they don't hear a thing I say. It's not registering. If you have to have a picture of Jesus, you're, you want a picture of Jesus? I'll give you a picture of Jesus. First of all, his head and his hair were white as white wool. His eyes are like a flame of fire. His feet burnish bronze. That glows in the furnace. His voice like the sound of many waters. You want a picture of Jesus? I mean, if I had a picture like that hanging on the wall, how many people would go over and say, Boy, I'm going to pray to you? Most of them kind of feel like that say, Who in the world is that guy? This is Jesus judging the church. You want a picture of Jesus? Where's judgment begin at? First... Peter 4, verse 7. Where are we going to see judgment begin in the book of Revelation? Right here. He said, if, the, if we are judged first, what shall be the end of those who are ungodly? And where shall the sinner appear? If we are judged first. This is the first judgment. This is the chapter 1 and 2 of the book of Revelation. And it says, Jesus has what in his mouth? Huh? How would you like to have a picture of Jesus with a big sword sticking out? I told the woman, you want a picture of him? I mean, Jesus is coming with a sword in his mouth. Now, I, that scares me. Jesus said, I'm going to... This isn't the merciful Jesus dying on a cross. This is the risen Jesus in glory with a sword in his mouth. Woo! This is not the Jesus that most people know. This is the Jesus that only a born-again, spirit-filled person in the church of Jesus knows, and he's very cautious and careful because he knows that. Because if we knew that Jesus was standing with a sword in his mouth, we would be careful how we worship next Lord's Day. I know people don't have a picture of Jesus this way because I see them coming into church so carelessly. I see them sitting there with their Bibles open so carelessly. I see them so careless in their prayer life and so careless in their spiritual life, so careless in their home life. There's no way they can see Jesus this way. If I had Jesus standing over me with a sword in his mouth and burning eyes burning through me, I'd say, Lord, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Amen? Amen? We don't have the right picture of Jesus. Those pictures are so registered in our mind that indelibly they are impressing us in the wrong vein, we got a wrong picture of Jesus, and it's affecting our whole life because all we're thinking of is the dainty, gentle, sweet, little, pussyfooting, effeminate Jesus that we think that people drew. That's not the Jesus that's here. First thing we do when we read the book of Revelation, we got to realize that this Christ with whom we have to do is a Christ that searches our hearts and that we need to fear. Because every thought is laid bare before him. He has seven stars. And out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in its strength. This is the eternal, divine, everlasting God, Jesus. Just because he became a man and we saw him in his weakness doesn't mean that he's, not going, that he's going to stay in a weak body all the rest of his eternity. He came from heaven, from the glory and the power he had, willingly submitted to the throes of death and life 
of a human being and a human body. And then he ascended back to the throne, sat down on the right hand of God of majesty. And now he's reigning forever and ever over his kingdom, the church of Jesus Christ. And if we are kings and priests of God under him, now he, we're looking at him, we've got to start acting like we're kings and priests of God. And living like we're kings and priests of God. This is the Jesus we see in Revelation. And I'll tell you what happens when you see Jesus this way in verse 17. I saw him. I fell at his feet like a dead man. Oh, we're so smug and so complacent and so arrogant and so... Uh, all of us are. We're just so arrogant. Especially when it comes to our Christianity, we get arrogant sometimes. The fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. Show me a man and woman who doesn't fear God, they're intellectual idiots. There's a lot of religious people who don't fear God. This is what he says, he fell like a dead man. Now he said he laid his right hand on him, verse 17. Now what was in his right hand? What was in Jesus' right hand? What was in his right hand? Stars, right? So if he laid his right hand on John, we know this is figurative. Because there's no way he could have laid his hand on John with all those stars in his hand. So we know that the symbols here are not literal. We're not to look for a Jesus with an ugly sword coming out of his mouth. We're not to look for Jesus with his eyes burning like fire. These are all symbols of judgment, discernment, and Godhead. Because God knows that we human beings have to have symbolic imagery to depict what is eternal. Are you reading me? Symbolic imagery. He's got to paint pictures because we're living in time and we've never seen eternity. We've never seen an eternal celestial being. And so somehow he's got to portray in our mind that the sword stands for speaking judgment. Man, I'll tell you what, if I had a sword in my mouth, if I had a sword in my mouth, there are going to be two kinds of people in this assembly when we got done. Dead ones and alive ones. The words I speak, you don't have to believe them. But if I had a sword in my mouth, the words I speak, you will either believe them or die. And that's why there's a difference between when I speak and when you speak and when we soul win, people can choose to take it or leave it, right? And when Christ comes, he's going to say, you're saved and you're lost, and that's it. You see, the sword is an execution. That's the picture. Uh, that's, that's the executional sword. I can't execute with my mouth. The Holy Spirit has to convict you, not me. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not God. I'm, I'm, I'm a nobody. I read the scripture. I do the best I can to explain them to you. But man, if we're going to register, it's going to take somebody more than Chuck Dowdy. It's going to take the Holy Spirit to interpret these things and put them down in your spirit where you're living at. And you're going to go out of here dead or alive. You're either going to be amused or you're going to be slain. Now, He laid his hand on me and said, don't, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead. <laughs> Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Now, let me ask you a question. He said, I am the living one, right? Verse 18. That means he has life in himself. He has life inherent. Okay? Self-contained life. None of you have self-contained life. You're not living people. You're receiving life. 
You can't say you're the living one. You are receiving life. Jesus is life, right? How long is that life that Jesus is? Forever and ever, past, present, future, ever, ever, ever. So he can give life, since he is life. He can give it, right? All right, if he is life, how can he die? He laid it light. Right. He's the only person who chose. For instance, you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know when you're going to die because you're not life. I mean, the guy can say you got terminal illness. You know, the doctor said you got four weeks to live, but you might live five weeks. <laughs> if there's any consolation, you know. <laughs> the doctor says, you know, I got good news for you and bad news, you know. <laughs> What's the bad news? You're going to die, brother. <laughs> well, what's the good news? I should have told you that yesterday. <laughs> so, <laughs> we are receiving life. Jesus said, I'm going to die. The hour of my death has come. The very second that he expired, he said, you don't take my life, I'm giving it to you. He gave life, gave his life, and then he raised his life back up again because he went into Hades. Now, death and Hades are a package deal. Back in those days, you died and you went into the spirit world. The spirit world was Hades. It was a Hadean world. The, the Greeks talked about it. It was down in the lower parts of the earth somewhere. They called it the lower regions of the earth. And, and uh, anyone who went there never came out again. <laughs> and the door was shut. It was called the door of Hades. It was called the gates of Hades. <laughs> and the minute you went here, slam, you know? That was it. And everybody who went there, they stayed there. Abraham was there. It was called his bosom. And all the people who lived after Abraham was there. Jacob was there. Isaac. Everyone down to Malachi was there. Even John the Immerser was there. The thief on the cross was there. Everybody was there. From the thief on the cross all the way back to Adam. Adam was there. Eve was there. And when they went in there to slam her shut, the stage shut. And then there came a man down from heaven that had keys. Uh, don't you want to know the man who has the keys to Hades? From this rock I build my church, and I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against her. Listen, you folks, if you're in the church that Jesus built, don't take it for granted. Because Hades is going to get everybody. But you, the gates of Hades, he who has the key, open that door. And for you, no one can shut it. That's why I can live confidently in Christ now. And if the doctor says, Chuck, you're going to die of cancer in a week, I can live confidently until the end. Because I am not going to Hades when I die. Amen? My Savior is the only person that has the keys. Mohammed don't have them. Buddha don't have them. Confucius don't have them. The president don't have them. The governor don't have them. I want to know the guy that's got the keys. And he said, I was alive. I'm dead. And I'm alive again. And verse 18, he said, I'm alive for 17 days. Huh. Aren't you glad? <laughs> He's still alive. And if we live forever, he said, I'm alive forevermore. This is a proof and a demonstration right there for these things which you've seen in the year 96 A.D. No, write these things that you've seen in the year 350 A.D. I'm telling you, it is outright foolishness to give a post-70 A.D. authorship to this book. It is outright foolishness. Anyone who has a late book is trying to take away from the inspiration of the scriptures and make Jesus a liar by putting a date on this book. 
And you went to college, and they taught you 96 A.D., didn't they, brother? They taught me 96 A.D., all of them. Everywhere you go, and you ask them, well, go back and ask them. Give me proof it was written in 96 A.D. They say, well, uh, our professor told us that. That's all they tell you. That's pitiful. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, the Roman Catholic Church wanted a, wanted a late date for the book of Revelation. And they got 350. And some of the people who don't believe in the inspiration of the Bible want a late date for it. Because the older the book gets, the more it loses its power. It doesn't have the punctuality to it. It's the device of the devil to take this book away from those people who lived in Nero's day. They needed that book because Nero was killing them like flies. He killed Paul. He killed Peter. And they were killing others and getting ready to kill more. And they put John in exile. You mean to tell me this book was written to comfort people who were dying and it wasn't published till 96 A.D.? 20 years after they died? I mean, that would be a disgrace. It's a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, basically. The, the, to say that the Holy Spirit couldn't have gotten this book out. And he said, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand, uh, the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are, are the seven churches. Now, what I'm going to do is take you back to three remarkable visions. I'm going to take you into Zechariah first. There are three visions that parallel Revelation 1. The first one from Zechariah, you might call this in Zechariah, which is the next to the last book in the Old Testament if you're having a part time find in old Zach. Uh, sorry to hold this mic in one hand and flip with my left hand. I'm not used to that, but I'll find him here in a second. Yeah, Zechariah 4, chapter 4. There are, there are three visions that are very significant. Now, this one vision I'm going to deal with. Uh, is uh, it's entitled, God has a problem. Hey, God's got a problem. All right, that's what you might call this vision. Uh, it starts out, the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was waking from his sleep. He was preaching in the Church of Christ on Sunday morning. <laughs> All right, verse 2. <laughs> All right. Now, <laughs> now, there's a mountain in this passage. You see, Zechariah was written along with three other books. Uh, these books uh, are very important books because they talk about the rebuilding of the temple, returning from captivity. Ezra. Nehemiah, and then we have Zechariah, and then we have Haggai. These are four important books. What about Haggai, H-A-G-G-A-I. Now, uh, these books actually should be together. They, you ought to have Ezra, Nehemiah, Zechariah, Haggai. They ought to be together because they all happened contemporary. They, they knew each other. These guys were contemporaries, and uh, they had just gotten back from the Babylonian captivity. Uh, 586, they'd been there. Jeremiah said, in 70 years, you're going to go back home. You're going to go back and build a temple, okay? And uh, so these men were contemporaries. Now, but however, you have 20 books in your Bible. And you have Zechariah and Haggai, 20 books in between them. That shouldn't be. They're all contemporaries. Now they're going to rebuild the temple. And Ezra, he goes up, and he's a scribe, and God puts the spirit in Ezra to go back and get this temple built. And Cyrus, the king, issued an edict that the king of Persia said, go back and build that temple. A heathen king is going to give money and resources to building the temple. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer, and uh, a little later he was weeping and crying, and the king said, what's wrong? He says, we're living in paneled houses, and the Lord's house is in ruins. 
And he said, why should not weep and cry? He said, we remodel our houses, we take care of our houses, what about uh, the Lord's? Now, of course, these are physical buildings. And, and the kingdom of God is not a physical building, but uh, that physical building was important because it was a, uh, it was a landmark. Uh, it was a gauge to judge the coming of Jesus. Now, Zechariah came along and, and wrote to chapter 4 about it, and him and Zerubbabel uh, were friends, and Zerubbabel was the craftsman, he was uh, a builder, and Haggai was, uh, was a preacher, and Zechariah was a preacher. It takes a preacher and a builder. Now Haggai, both of these men were prophets, and they had to preach to the people. Uh, uh, when Nehemiah went up there uh, on his uh, beast of burden, he couldn't even make his way through the rubbish. Uh, the, the temple had fallen down and was in such a state of disrepair that, that his beast of burden couldn't even go through. And, and uh, he said, as God is my witness, he went to the Jews and said, how can we uh, let this happen? The, the, the God's house is in ruins. Uh, and then Haggai came along and, uh, and God said, I own the silver and the gold. Uh -uh. He said, everything's mine. And he said, why don't you take care of my house? Uh, and, and so Haggai preached to them and, and they started giving they started giving their resources. Uh, they were, some of them were bankrupt. It was hard times, economic hard times, but they gave anyhow. And the more they gave, the more God blessed. Uh, we're remodeling our building up where I'm at now, and my wife and I agreed to give more. The minute we agreed to give more in our offering, we obligated God to something. Did you know that? What do we obligate God to? He's got to bless me. Because I'm going to give him some more. Well, I don't have to give him and I don't need blessings. I got all I need. But I'm going to give you more anyhow. He's going to say, I'm sorry, Chuck, but I'm going to have to give you more. You don't need it, but I'm going to have to give it to you. I mean, I mean that with all my heart. I, I tell you, they taught me that when I was a 12-year-old boy taking newspapers. I had an elder come to my church, and uh, he said, we're in a building program. Can uh, your mom and dad give me anything? And mom and dad said, yeah, we'll give. And, and so they made a commitment. And, and he said, boy, what do you do? I said, I take newspapers. He said, how much you make? I said, seven bucks a week. He said, you owe the Lord 70 cents. I said, it'll be there. And I got an envelope just like my mom and dad did. I put 70 cents in there every week for my newspaper route. And I have been given to God ever since then. And I want to tell you something. As I stand before you, my witness before God tonight, I've had hard times. I've never had a need that wasn't met by God. Fifty-five years I've served him. I've never had a need that's not been met by God. And I've never worried about money either, by the way. It's the least of my worries. No, that's what Haggai said. Okay, so the Spirit begins to work. I announced that we're going to build a building by the Spirit of God. i never forget that when I was at Winchester. And there was a preacher there. <laughs> he went out there and he said, that guy's crazy. He said, the Holy Spirit can't build a building. He said, whoever heard of such a thing as that? Well, I still believe God can build buildings by His Spirit. Because in Zechariah 4... He said, what do you see? I said, I see a lampstand. In verse 2, all gold with its bowls on top, seven lamps. I see two olive trees, two olive trees on the right side and on the other on the left side. I answered and I said to the angel, who's speaking to me here? Who are these, my Lord? And the angel was speaking to me said, don't you know who these are? And you know, God keeps saying, don't you know what this is? This is something you should know. Why don't you know? It's something that's so obvious, <laughs> so understandable. So explicable. Why in the world don't you know? Why, why are we ignorant uh, of who these guys are? You know, when God sees something that is so obvious, and we're down here like a bunch of ignoramuses, it bothers God. Don't you know? If there's something you should know, you ought to know what this is talking about. Right? Three times he asked him, what's, what, what's wrong with you? I mean, he didn't call him a noomscoff. He didn't call him a numbskull. He just said, don't you know? He said, this is the word of the Lord. It's rubbable. Not by my, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain, before it's rubbable? God speaks to the mountain. And, and he mentions the rubbable by name. You know, a lot of us don't know that God knows us by name. A lot of us don't know that God knows our needs. Every need we have. We go through life saying, oh, I wonder if he sees. We think God's up in heaven with binoculars looking around there trying to see if there's anything wrong out there, you know? 
He said, what is that? He said, it's a sevenfold spirit whose eyes sweep to and fro like radar, just going like that all the time. Radar like that all the time. God sees everything. And we're down here on earth saying, God, do you know what's going on? I know what's going on. I got a mountain. But God's got a problem. It's not my problem. God has a problem with my mountain. And the Holy Spirit's got a plan. Look at this. This is the word of the Lord. This is God talking. You're going to build that temple not by power, not by might, but by the Spirit. What are you, great mountain, getting that temple built? He says, Rebel's going to, uh, he's going to survey what Nehemiah saw. They're going to clean up all those rocks and all that ruin and all that uh, rubble. And they're going to take a transit or a plumb line. They're going to stretch it out. They're going to put the line down. They're going to put down the foundation. They're going to put down the wall. And eventually they're going to finish the table, the temple. It's going to take them 16 years to do it, but they're going to do it. God not only knows that you've got a project ahead of you, He knows how long it's going to take, and He knows when it's going to be finished. That's how much God knows. And the word came to me, the hand of the rebel bull in verse 9 laid the foundation. His hand will finish it, and then you'll know the Lord of God has sent me to you. And who has despised the day of small things? Little old me. Little old you. You think you're a nobody. But ah, oh, with God, you're somebody. And the eyes of the Lord sweep to and fro. Verse 10. And then I answered again to him, What are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on the left? Now, he asked the same question again. And then the angel didn't even answer him. The guy's so stupid, he asked him once. He said, Don't you know? He's so stupid, he asked again. The angel didn't even answer him. Shame on you for not knowing who these, who these two guys are. And then I answered the second time. I said to him, verse 12, Well, what are the two olive branches what, what, that are beside the two golden pipes with, uh, that empty the golden oil from themselves? And he said again, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Three times he pleaded ignorance. Would you like to know what he's talking about? Okay, here's the lamp. There's a big bowl up here. Here's a lamp. Here's the tubes like IVs going out. Man, these guys. Two of the most important people on the face of this earth. These are two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Someone's got to build this temple. And Joshua, the high priest, is irrevable. You have an administrator, you have two. You have a judicial, and you have an executive. You have an administrative, you have an executive. You've got to have two. Always two. Always two. Can't have one. And if all you knew was this, all you'd know is that those two guys, the whole earth, all that's important to God on the earth is not what's going on down in Egypt, what's going on down in Syria, what's going on down in Greece, what's going on down in Rome, what's going on down on Carthage in Africa, what's going on down up in, up in Europe. God don't care about nothing except what? These two guys who stand before him and the whole earth getting their job done. And the only way they're going to get it done, they've got to have the Holy Spirit pumped into them, into their spiritual veins like an IV, dripping it, dripping it, dripping it, dripping it. And they're going to do it in the Spirit of God. That's the only way they're going to do it. How many of us ever served the Lord in the flesh? Come on, be honest with me. We sing in the flesh. We work in the flesh. We study in the flesh. We talk in the flesh. We work too much in the flesh. Sometimes we're hypocrites in the flesh. Aren't we? Not by might, not by power, not by oration, not by eloquence, not by knowing more than somebody else, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. All right, and that's the first vision. That mountain's going to move. And that mountain may be something in your own life individually. 
It might be a financial crisis, family crisis. It could be anything. You don't have a problem. God does. Who are you, mountain? God's talking to your mountain, right? Yep. You don't have a problem. God's talking to your mountain. He says, your mountain before Brother Smith. Your mountain before Brother Ryan. Your mountain before uh, Bro Brother Gray. Okay? you got a mountain in front of you, and God's talking to your mountain before you. He's the one that's taking the responsibility for your mountain. And does that, do you see that? And if you're on the sunny side of the mountain, or you're on the shady side of the mountain, and you look at that big mountain and say, wow, God said, I will level it like a plain. The reason that you're having a problem with your mountain is we look at the mountain, we don't look at God. All right? Only in the spirit can we face these mountains. All right? Now, the next one here is in Revelation 1, but I'm going to jump over to Revelation chapter 11, where we have almost an identical parallel to what we just read about in Revelation, I mean in uh, Zechariah chapter 4. Uh, in Revelation uh, and chapter 11, this parallel is awesome, absolutely awesome. Uh, there was given me a, a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, rise up, measure the temple of God. And the older, and those who worship in it. And leave out the court, which is outside the temple. Don't measure it. It's given to the nations, and they'll tread it underfoot of uh, the holy city for 42 months. Now, this is the, the pagan church versus the spiritual church. Now, how many members are in the pagan church? How many members? And how many are in the spiritual church? How many professed Christians want to be measured by the rod? <laughs> and how many of them want church vanity just to play church? How many of them, if Jesus Christ measured them right now with a measuring rod, and they saw what they have to live up to, would quit the church tomorrow and quit playing church. They'd either get in or get out. That's what this rod's going to do. This is New Testament Christianity. Now he said, I'm going to give my authority to the witnesses, and they'll prophesy. 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Same thing we saw back in Zechariah. Here we have a cruise of oil. We have the lampstands, the light. You shine like lights in the world. Or are we in darkness? How many souls did we win to Christ last year? Why aren't souls being won to Christ? Is our church 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600? How big a church do they have on the first day of the church? Yeah. Why are souls not being won to Christ? I want to know. Tell me why. We're Christians, right? You mean to tell me we are so bleak? So faint-hearted, a bunch of zombies running around, that people look at us as so unattractive that they don't see anything else in us that they desire? When Christ measures us up, he's going to look at how many souls we have, you know? When I go fishing, the first thing they look at when I come back home is my stringer. And I don't care how smart or how dumb you are. I don't care if you've got enough brains to fill a hog head or a thimble. I want to know how many fish are on your stringer. Isn't that a just question to ask? I mean, uh, this is revelation. This is revelation. Now, the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord... If anyone desires to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth, devours their enemies, and anyone who desires to harm them in a manner he must be killed. They're very important to God. When God looks down upon the planet Earth, the, the last thing in the world he cares about, and as much as I like Sarah Palin, as much as I like John McCain, 
and as much as I, the other two. God could care less compared to these witnesses who stand before him and the whole earth. There's only one thing that God's looking at. Don't you know? The, these are the testimony and the witness for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in all the world. That's all God cares about. The messenger's taking the gospel to the whole world. And he's sitting back scratching his head, don't you know that? When are you going to wake up and do it? Well, who are these two witnesses? Don't you know? I'm saying, who are they? Don't you know? You've been in church all your life and you don't know that these witnesses are all that God cares about? But we meet every Sunday morning, we sing, don't you know? We have prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Don't you know? We build church buildings. Don't you know? We got it all screwed up, don't we? We got it all messed up. It'd be better for me if I'm not a soul winner in the church where I preach at to just stay at home. If I'm going to win souls, I'm going to stay home. Don't you know? All right, now, these two witnesses are going to kill them. And their dead bodies are going to lie on the street. And everybody in the world is happy because they're dead. In verse 10, they're going to make merry about them. Man, it's tribulation when you start witnessing for Christ. New Testament Christianity. Whew. <laughs> I don't know why I've been able to reach as many people as I have because... The opposition out there is so powerful, so great. Everyone who loves me, there's ten who hate me. And it's a wonder that I've been able to do what I've done, and Doug's been able to do what he's done, and you've been able to do what you've done. It, it's a wonder. That they don't kill us, and after we're dead, have a party, and send gifts to each other, and celebrate the death of the preacher. Are you with me? Crucify the guy. The witness. Could be an evangelist, could be a, an elder, it could be a deacon, it could be anybody who cares about souls. They kill them every time. I've seen them kill them every time. I remember one time when I was preaching out in Ohio. I was just a young preacher, and church was growing like crazy. <laughs> and uh, 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 one guy didn't like me, he was a deacon. He wanted to get rid of me in a worse way. So. Uh, one day I got up and I preached, and the whole Carter family came, plus all their relatives. There was about 12 people that I baptized that Sunday morning. And he was up in the front, and I heard him. I mean, I'm deaf as a bullfrog in the wintertime, but I heard what the guy said. He said to his wife, Oh, no. How are we going to get rid of him? <laughs> he said, He's got 12 more votes. I heard him. He could care less about 12 baptisms. He hated me so much. And when somebody despises you, there's nothing you can do to change it. You might as well mark it down. When somebody despises you in their heart, you could be a prince charming on a white horse going around ringing golden bells and bringing all the crescendo of heaven down on earth. And they would still hate your guts because nothing can win a brother or sister who are offended and despiteful toward another brother or sister. And that's why sometimes the best thing to do is just pray. Because you can't win them. Winning a brother who's offended is harder than winning a walled city. Proverbs. So then he says, these, these angels, Now, there's people who say churches have angels. That's kind of silly to think that a church has a celestial angel. I agree with Hendrickson. Here's a word for evangelist, and here's a word for angel.
angelos, you angelos. The word angel just simply means messenger. Some, actually some translations just translate the messengers of the churches. Angelos means messenger. You put a U on it, and it means good news messenger. That's the gospel, good news. In Mark chapter 1, it mentions all, all the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were evangelists. You say, well, uh, Matthew was an apostle, John was an apostle, that's true, but they were also evangelists. Jesus ordained them and said, preach the good news, evangelize, evangelize. So they were not just apostles, they were evangelists as well. In fact, two of them were not apostles, and that was Luke and Mark. But they were accompanied by the apostles. Luke was an eyewitness, and John Mark was an accomplice to the apostle Paul. So they were able to write things that the apostles wanted them to write. They were apostolic, but they were not apostles. So when we talk about messenger, this is the person who is delivering this message. Now you have two here. And, and that's generally the way that they went out and evangelized. Two by two. Jesus Christ, okay. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The first evangelist and the energy that he delivered it with when he gave it to the apostles, he gave them the opportunity to have the Holy Spirit work through them as apostles. And they then moved on to designate other people to be evangelists. Exactly. Is that right or wrong? And you're right. Now, if you look at this, you're exactly right. In Ephesians 4.11, you have apostles, you have prophets, you have evangelists, you have pastors, and you have teachers. Now, two of these are foundational. By foundational, that means in Ephesians 2.20, that you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. Evangelists are ongoing. Pastors are ongoing. Teachers are ongoing. Deacons are an auxiliary. They are chosen as the church has need of them. They're not a part of the ongoing program, but in every generation, as you need them, you choose them. For instance, we have seven deacons, okay? Now, when he says the mystery of the seven stars in my right hand, this is the messenger of the church, this is the messenger, this is the angelos of the church. But what happened is, the messenger had to give this message. Christ didn't give it, the messenger had to. There's a difference between Christ standing up here and talking to you, and a messenger to the church. What's the vast difference? I'll tell you one thing, he can do a whole lot better job than we can. Now he said, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. He says this, I know your deeds. Just as the Holy Spirit sweeps to and fro, uh, he said, I know. He said, now you've toiled, you've persevered, uh, you, you don't endure evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles. They are not. They're deceitful workers or false apostles. It, you, you, you tested them and said, you're not apostles. And you've persevered, and you've endured for my name's sake, and I'm not grown weary. Now, if I had a church like that, I'd say, wow, this is a great church. Uh-uh. You can do all of those things. You can have a church habit. You can put forth your tithe and your offering and your feet and your energy and throw it all into the church. You can pre preserve. You can, be, uh, you can have a, a pen for being in Sunday school for 20 years. But he said, I have this against you. You've left your first love. You're not doing it for Jesus. 
There's three things you got to do. You got to remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Remember. Next thing you got to do is you got to repent. Do the deeds that you did at first, or I'm coming to you. And number four, number three, remove your lampstand out of its place until you repent. Now, there are, that is a three point sermon there, Brother Smith. Remember, the prodigal son said he came to his senses and remembered. He said, my father's house has slaves that are living better than I am. He remembered. Repent, that's the second R. And if you don't repent, we're going to smash you. We're going to remove it. All the stuff you've done up here in verse 3 don't mean a thing. If you've lost your first love for Jesus. If the love of Jesus isn't beaten in my heart, down, down, deep in my heart, the love of Jesus, the love of Jesus, everything for Jesus, all for Jesus, all for Jesus. Everything. Talk for Jesus. Pray for Jesus. Soul win for Jesus. Preach for Jesus. Teach for everything. Christ is at the center of it. And self is totally dead. If all that that I do doesn't have that first love in it. Now, he's being fair with me. He said, remember, Chuck, you've fallen. You don't have the joy you used to have in the Lord anymore. It don't show from your face. It's not there. We're lethargic. We're like a bump on the log. And a toad on the frog on the bump on the log. And a wart on the frog on the toad on the bump on the log. And the hair on the wart on the frog on the toad on the bump on the log. And a flea on the hair on the wart on the frog on the bump on the log. And the hole in the bottom of the sea. That's what we're like. It shows. We get more excited watching the Washington Deadskins make a football play than we do about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not kidding you. I mean, something happens on the, uh, we're, we're watching the, on, on a long distance screen. Oh, your wife comes running down. What happened? They just scored a first down. We go to church. Oh, oh my, how dry. How dry is the hour. I wonder if he's going to quit. It's all getting late. Right? How many of us have ever read the Bible for an hour? One solid hour. And yet we watch a true romance or we watch some soapbox opera. We'll go to a movie and we'll sit there in trance watching nothing but trash and vaudeville second-rate acting that could never compare to what you're seeing in this book. And we sit there in trance watching trash. And yet we've never read the Bible for an hour with tears running down our cheeks. We don't weep anymore. We don't cry anymore over Jesus. We don't weep anymore over sin. Are you with me? He said, if you don't repent, whatever happened to that church at Ephesus? That church at Ephesus, and you can read in some of the stuff I wrote on it, that church at Ephesus was the first church in Asia. It was a mile from the Aegean Sea. It was a commercial center. And within a couple of hundred years, they plowed that city out for six miles. It's nothing but a marsh. It's gone. Not only the church, but the whole city's gone. Now notice what he says here. I'm glad you hate the deeds and the Nicolaitans. Now, I'm going to close with the Nicolaitans. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get a wash cloth here and clean this board off. And I'm going to close with the Nicolaitans. Uh, Nico comes from the word Nicholas, Irenaeus, who, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. John's third generation disciple, Irenaeus said that Nico came from the word Nicholas. And Nicholas was one of the deacons in the early church, and he fell away. And the word Nico means to suppress or to put down. And laity, Nicolation, was the Greek word for people. Mm. Mm. All right. Now in Acts 20, 28, 29, Paul went to Ephesus. 
This is the very city that he's talking to right now. It's at Ephesus that they worship Diana of the Ephesians. Her name was Artemis. They don't know when, but she's supposed to have fallen down from heaven. And uh, she was a grotesque statue, a black, ugly-looking statue with a club in one hand and a saber in the other hand. She had many breasts, and she was a fertility goddess, and they worshipped her. This ugly-looking, dark, <laughs> club-wielding woman <laughs> with many breasts, <laughs> and they, it was like Buddha. It was a female Buddha. And they say, great is Diana in the Ephesians. And uh, that was their god, their goddess, their fertility goddess. And Paul had to preach to them. And uh, in, in, in Acts 20, 28, he told the Ephesians, he says to, to the elders, he ordained elders in, in the Ephesian church, he said, feed the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. For he says, after my departure, wolves will come in, not sparing the flock, and he said, and there shall arise from your own selves. There shall arise from your own selves, false prophets. From within the ranks. So you have the word elder given here. And he also called them bishops. There was no distinction between elder and bishop because the bishop showed that he overseen the flock. The elder meant that he was an older person. But Paul said that out of this, there's going to be something happen. This is the original setup. So you had the gift of Christ to the church. You had evangelists and you had pastors, each functioning in a common role. Gifts from Christ, not foundational, but ongoing, down through the ages. It's supposed to have been something that was set in order until the church was presented to God in its fullness. Now, this suppressing of the laity, what happened in 96 AD, by the way, which is when the Catholics believed the Bible was or some people believe that uh, the, the Bible was completed. Ignatius of Antioch, he got the idea that unless you had a bishop, and they began to reserve the word bishop for certain regional men who presided over a delegation of churches. At first, the elders and bishops, they were the same. They only presided over a local church. And notice that each one of these churches are local. There's no agency outside the church. They're all local. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, they're all local. But we have Ignatius teaching that a bishop has authority over more than one. And he made the statement that you couldn't even celebrate the Lord's Supper if you didn't have a bishop present. So not only is he advocating oversight on the bishop, but he is over uh, advocating that the whole congregation is under the supervision of the bishop and that they have absolutely no functionary capacity at all unless a bishop is present. Now that wasn't so bad, but it got worse. As it got worse, uh, they began to teach a succession of bishops. That meant that by the time of Clement of Rome, Clement said that it is only a true church if it can trace its bishopric back to the apostles. So this is what you call apostolic succession. Others came along and delivered more death blows against the church, uh, such as uh, 
Tertullian. Tertullian also said that it is only a true church if it has apostolic succession. Now this apostolic succession meant a whole lot to these guys. Because they're going to suppress the laity, and we have now what we call a clergy. And I have a book here, a remarkable book. It's written by Kenneth Scott Latterette. If you're ever to a bookstore, you need to buy this. And uh, this is a best church history book I've ever had. Uh, Kenneth Scott Latterette, he wrote it. It's very readable. It's easy to read. And that he says, uh, I think it's on page 152 of his book, that by the year 200, there was no longer a equivalency of elder and bishop like it was in Bible days. There was a distinction between a bishop and an elder, whereby the bishop began to strive for power and mastery over the churches. By doing that, they were able to Nicolaitanize. And they called the people laity, and they called themselves clergy. And now we have bishops all over the Roman world. And they're making a distinction between lay people, so to speak. The word laity just means people, 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 you want to call them that, and clergy. Now, what's this going to do to Jesus Christ? Well, first of all, we're going to lose the distinction of having an elder over a local church and an evangelist delivering the message. We're going to lose that. Now we're going to have bishops over a contingency of churches until you have district bishops and regional bishops and by the time of 500 you have four bishops vying for power in Constantinople, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Rome. Now Ignatius in 96 to 200 began to teach the supremacy of the bishop. They taught original sin. The bishops began to teach original sin to satisfy uh, those who worshipped their god of their children. They dedicated their children to the mother god. Candles were introduced in 320. Angels were worshipped in 375. The mass was celebrated in 394. Mary was called upon uh, instead of Jesus in 381 to 431, the Council of Ephesus of all things. The Council of Ephesus, get this, because the bishops were so successful in pleasing the heathen that all that Paul did in Ephesus by destroying the worship of Diana was restored by, in Ephesus, they began to worship Mary in the place of Diana. So the whole work that Paul did in Ephesus was undone by the bishops. Robes were introduced, and the clergy began to wear a garb different from the, the laity, 500. They began to call the, the, the man in uh, uh, Rome, the pontiff, in 533. Uh, he said he's the head of all the bishops. Uh, purgatory, 593. The Latin Mass, 600. Mary was worshipped in 600. The Pope's toe was kissed in 709. Images were introduced to the church in 787. Temporary power was given to the Pope in 750, which meant he had power over all the kings of the earth. Uh, water with a pinch of salt in it was used to christen people uh, in 850, and if a priest could sprinkle you with water with salt in it, you were sanctified. St. Joe was worshipped in 840. <clears throat> Bells were introduced in 965. The canonization of dead saints were 995. If you died and they canonized you, uh, then uh, you were shot for a cannon, okay, but no. Uh, 995, uh, you became a saint in the church. Uh, 
uh, uh, Lent and Friday, uh, not eating meats, 998 on Friday. The Mass was sacrificed in the 11th century. Celibacy of the priest, 1079. The rosary was used because the Hindus and the Muslims uh, were so successful in having rosaries that uh, they thought we need them too. So they copied it from the Mohammedan people who have a rosary around their neck, 1090. They began to have one for the church. The Inquisition to kill heretics, say 1184. Indulgences where you would uh, uh, sell sins uh, and then uh, uh, have people pay them for it. <laughs> uh, you could pay for your sins, 1190. Transubstantiation was practiced in 1215 by Innocent III, where it, the, uh, the blood turns into the literal body of Jesus uh, uh, and the blood of Jesus. Confession to the priest, 1215. The wafer uh, was forbidden to the laity in 1220. The laity couldn't eat the wafer uh, and the cup. Uh, because they, uh, they, you could eat the wafer, but the cup was not given to them uh, be, uh, because they were afraid that they would spill it on the floor and, and uh, throw the blood of Jesus down on the ground, okay? Uh, the scapular was introduced in 1287. This was a hat that the monks wear, and if you put this hat on, it would protect you against evil spirits. Uh, uh, they forbid the cup to the lady in 1414. Uh, the seven sacraments, 1439. 1545... Uh, they said traditions are on par with the Bible. 1854, Mary was born immaculately. She, she wasn't born in sin, and she was born miraculously. 1864, science was condemned. 1931, Mary was called the mother of God. There's other things that they're going to come up with. But why that Jesus hated the Nicolaitans is because that Jesus could look down through history and see all of that coming. He saw it all coming. So that the, they made void the teachings of Jesus Christ. And he said, if you overcome, you're going to die and go to the paradise of God, if you overcome. Now, there's one more thing I want to say in wrapping this up, is that this apostolic succession, this is nothing new. The Greek Orthodox said their patriarchs, were successors to the apostles. The Greek Orthodox in the, in the East started it, and then the Roman Church picked up on it. So apostolic succession is that we have apostles who are more important in the church than the original apostles. But we know that the original apostles are the only ones that God will judge the world by, not by pseudo-false apostles. And these people in Ephesus tried these apostles, found them to be false. I take my Bible, and I lay it down beside all this stuff I see here. I try it, and I see that these apostles, so-called, made mistakes, and they taught false doctrine. We have to be able to put the Bible up against all of that, go back to the New Testament. And this is where that the man in the pulpit, he who's delivering the message, has got to set people straight, whether they like it or not, and whatever happened to the man in the pulpit, the evangelist? Now we have godly elders, there are still elders that are still after the mold here. But what happened to the evangelist? Well, in the second century, there was one man who tried to rebuke this stuff for an evangelist is an evangelist if he's working for Christ he sees false doctrine he's got to call attention to it and this man's name was none other than Hippolytus Hippolytus rebuked carnal pleasure, worldliness, and he incurred the wrath of the people. On page 35, uh, he fought against the original sin when it was being taught. Uh, he was like a star in the hand of Jesus. In Daniel 12, verse 3, it says, He who turns wicked people to righteousness is like the stars of heaven. Soul winners, people who are not ashamed of the testimony of Jesus, people who are spreading the word of God everywhere, they're like stars in the hand of Jesus. So while we have stars in the hand of Jesus, they're not seeking stardom. 
They're getting stardom because they're winning souls to Christ. Uh, and they're rebuking false doctrine. Uh, and, 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 and they're calling attention to the abuses of carnality and evilness, chariot races and carnal pleasure. And, and that's what Hippolytus did. And he was called an evangel. In Willis and Walker's History of the Christian Church, that's the last time I see the word evangel in history. They were killed, they died off, they disappeared. It wasn't until Walter Scott came along. Right? Walter Scott in the year 1850, I believe, that we have the Golden Tongue Orator coming back. Now, there was one more guy I'm going to give credit to. His name was Chris Austin. You've got you to know a little church history sometimes. Chrysostom in the third century, like Hippolytus, he rebuked original sin. He rebuked the rise of the bishops. He also rebuked worldly pleasure. He was a pacifist. He didn't believe in war. But he was a strong preacher, and the emperor had him exiled too. <laughs> Just like John. <laughs> After Chrysostom, the evangelists disappeared from the face of the earth. There were no more evangelists until Walter Scott. I don't know of any evangelists. I can read that book through, this thick book here, and all you see is the rise of the bishops. As far as elders and evangelists working together, like it did in the early church, that can be restored. But bringing the evangelist back is even harder than bringing the elder back. Because the evangelist is the most